Good morning on this Sunday, November 3rd, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. Governor Brian Kemp unveils his much-anticipated health care plan. The Secretary of State prepares for another purge of hundreds of thousands of voter registrations and a Fox 5 I-Team investigation. A grand jury is recommending the county coroner be removed from office. Darren, Phil, and Alexis are all here. Republican Corey Ruth is going in for Janelle this week. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. Governor Brian Kemp unveiled his much-anticipated health care waiver plan this week. His goal to make the private marketplace more accessible and more affordable to Georgians. Insurance premiums are too dang high. Governor Brian Kemp was adamant that Georgians who don't have access to health care shouldn't have to get it through Obamacare and the federal website healthcare.gov. I know Georgians are losing faith in a one-size-fits-all system. The Georgia waiver proposal includes two phases, which has never been done before. Phase one includes a state-based reinsurance program, which means in order to reduce premiums, the state will back up private insurers, reimbursing them for high-cost claims. The program takes a regional approach, prioritizing parts of the state with the highest premiums. In Atlanta and other metro areas, the state will only cover those claims at 15 percent. But in southwest Georgia, where premiums are currently some of the highest in the country, the state would reimburse insurers at 80 percent. Phase two would allow the state to waive participation in the federalhealthcare.gov website and will instead allow insurers and brokers to sell plans directly to consumers. It's 2019. I know that we can do better. Now, Georgia must still get approval from the federal government, but Kemp's office says they have been in constant contact with the Trump administration and hope to get that final approval about a year from now. And Darren, I want to start with you because it's complicated, yeah. um, but let's talk about your opinions, first of all, on this plan. Well, I agree with the governor that the insurance premiums are too dang high. I mean, that's exactly <laughs> how he said it. I love and that soundbite. And this is something that Democrats have been saying for a while, and I think especially when you look at employee health insurance you know folks in Georgia who are uninsured because they don't have access to affordable health insurance but also folks who are not under their employers health insurance and so that, that that drives up the premiums I think the governor is to be commended for definitely taking a first and now second hopefully third step to dealing with the Medicaid expansion crisis we have but I do have to agree with what Democrats said is that we do need to work towards a full Medicaid expansion plan in Georgia and that's, I guess, more to come on the Medicaid um, plan under Governor Kemp. Phil, no more, I guess, the Georgians won't be forced to use federalhealthcare.gov, the website. I remember the, the disastrous rollout of that website. That's right. Uh, remember, these two waivers are really uh, getting us away from the expensive and tyrannical Obamaca Obamacare that drove up all of the uh, premiums in the first place. And so it's not just Democrats, but Republicans and everybody else uh, is in favor of lower insurance premiums. So the governor has come through. It's a more Georgia-centric program that will lower premiums. Now, there'll be another announcement tomorrow on Monday that uh, we are going to get, as, it, as the video pointed out, a second waiver, and that's going to affect 400,000 low-income people. So these are steps that are bad, that are really needed, and I, I have to commend the governor and his team for working on this very hard. I mean, this was really thought out. Corey, thank you for being here and filling in for Janelle. Your take on this, because he, he also is really concentrating on rural Georgia as well with those premiums. Yeah, I mean, I th the Affordable Care Act, Act has always been a rule-based framework and Kemp is proposing new rules that achieve what both sides want. It provides more state coverage but at the same time, or more state control but at the same time it expands coverage and reduces premiums. So I think it's an all-around good plan. Obviously it's going to have to adjust as the, cha as the state continues to change. But whenever you can have state solutions for state problems, I think that's better than a one-size-fits-all federal uh, solution. Alexis, is this what both sides want? Well, I'm not sure. I think the, on the Democratic side, they've been pushing for the expansion of Medicare, Medicaid mm -hmm. for, through the state, which would help about 600,000 Georgians. This is not going to do as much, so we'll have to see what's going to happen. Also, I'm concerned about the cost. I mean, it's going to cost the state, what did it say, $300 million initially. But if they expanded the Medicaid, they would get the federal funding, and then they'd have to pay as the, as the draw goes down on the long run, on the back end, uh, rather on the front end. So it's just going to be interesting to see. Plus, they're giving the money to the insurance companies. So that I don't see how that's bringing premiums down at all. 
we'll probably make them go up because they're going to subsidize them. All right. So we'll well, more see. news to come on this issue and some other big news this week. The Georgia Secretary of State's office has announced a new purge of voter registrations. This time, more than 300,000 names will be taken off the voting list. They'll notify the voters first. If they don't respond within 30 days, that's when they'll take action. And something else that's really different, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger has made the list of names public for the first time. And Phil, that's what's different. Well, that's right, and it's a very good move by the Secretary of State. Uh, if you see your name on the list and you want to re-register, you can do it online or you can go to any of the uh, voter registration offices in any of Georgia's 159 counties. And uh, I do think that this is in line with many other states. Uh, you can easily see that. It's only 4%. Uh, of all uh, Georgians that this is affected. And, and basically here, what we're doing is following state and federal law. There's a federal law that was signed by Bill Clinton back in 1993 that requires the fact that we update this. And, and, and the whole point of this is accuracy. Farron, this is where the controversy, though, came in for Georgia right. last time. There were more than 500,000 voter registration purges. Yeah, and exactly what you just said. This is the first time that the list has been made public. So I encourage all of our viewers to go online, www.sos.ga.gov, to basically see if your name is on the list. Number two is that if you have changed your name because you got married or if you've changed addresses or if you filled out the postcard with a national uh, change of address card, you you are now going to be sent by the state secretary of state's office to verify that you actually live at that new address. And so I don't want to make this so partisan. I really want to make sure that folks take the time out to go online. And then if you get that little card in the mail, which many of us think it may or may not be junk mail, really make sure you fill it out and send it back in. So I think the secretary of state is to be commended. And I encourage all these organizations to join forces and make sure folks realize that they have to basically fill out that verification form and send it back in. And if not, you're going to be purged off the list. Corey, the change in... Well, go ahead, Alexis. No, I was just say, I'm angry that there are 300,000 purges after we had record turnout, you know, in 2018. Who didn't vote? It's well, maybe they're dead or moved away. But why would 300,000 people dead in a year? No, but well, people are coming and going and moving and moving counties and yeah. there's a lot well, of transition I'm, in Georgia. Every state in the union does this. Corey, weigh in on this because they did yeah. change the law um, so, so that you have to be notified within a certain amount of time. So I do a lot of work advising uh, chief information officers and chief data officers. And if you ask any chief data officer of any Fortune 500 company what their number one priority is outside of security, it's making sure that they have good data quality control. Mm -hmm. And that includes making sure data is accurate, making sure data is up to date, and making sure that um, data is not duplicated. And so in terms of good data hygiene and making sure that you're maintaining quality within your data sets, it, it involves uh, going through the data and making sure you're deduplicating and making sure that the data is accurate. The, the problem with uh, the controversy, the political controversy, I don't think has anything to do with the data quality process, which is what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. I think it has more to do with the data governance, which is what Theron was referencing when he talked about uh, making the list uh, public. Yeah. I think the state needs a steering committee to provide the governance and the rules for managing the data quality, and that steering committee should be made up of Republicans and Democrats and perhaps some private sector data, uh, chief data officers, just to make sure that we're managing data quality. That's a great idea. I also want them to put automatic uh, registration with vote, um, state ID cards. Yeah. You know, because if you don't have a car, you don't need a driver's license. So I think that was a wonderful thing that they implement with a driver's license. So if they just put it across the board for state ID. All right. Well, coming up, Georgia's lieutenant governor is taking no chances when it comes to maintaining Republican control of the state Senate. We'll discuss straight ahead. Have a question or comment for the Georgia gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. We know that House Democrats have eyes on their chamber for a possible takeover next year, and Georgia's lieutenant governor is taking no chances, especially when it comes to Metro Atlanta State Senate districts. Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan has raised more than $300,000 to help incumbent Republicans maintain their seats and possibly win back others. Phil, Republicans are safe, really, when it comes to control of the state Senate, but there are districts that are getting more competitive. We were thinking of maybe John Albers and Roswell, Kay Kirkpatrick and Marietta really come to 
to mind. Jen Jordan comes to yes. mind, the radical liberal that unfortunately is my quote representative, unquote. <laughs> but um, th this is nothing uh -huh. unusual. Both parties are going to be uh, swimming in money for 2020. And I think both the Democrats and the Republicans uh, are, are smart to be doing this early because it's going to be like a big vacuum cleaner that both the Democrats and the Republicans are going to be doing for the U.S. Senate seats. They're two competitive seats, as we know, in November 2020, and uh, also for the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. So not unusual. Um, I think the state Senate is going to be firmly in Republican control. Yes, we want to flip some. The state House is going to be something we really have to watch because there was some Republican hemorrhaging of some seats in 2016. The Democrats, Theron, it's always these metro Atlanta districts that we're really watching closely to see what happens. Well, as you just pointed out, I mean, Democrats in the Senate and in the House have been raising money for a long time to not only protect the seats that they currently have, but also go aggressively after some of the seats in the metro area and in the rural area. What is so interesting about what Lieutenant Governor Duncan is doing is that not only that he's raising money, he's created a pack, but if you look at the way that they've boosted this on social media, I mean, it's gotten earned media, it's gotten an article. I mean, he's really sort of saying, hey, we're going to make sure that these Republican senators know that they're going to have the resources to really try to retain their seats. But just notice that the seats you just pointed out, these are all metro area uh, seats. And one of the things that we know Republicans are very, very upset and sort of scared about is how do they protect suburban, disaffected, white Republican women who, for whatever reason, has felt like the party has gone a little too far right with some of the Trump supporters that we have out here. And so I think that you'll see Democrats now shift their focus from just uh, not only picking up seats in the metro area, but also focusing on some of these rural areas where we know that the demographics are changing. Corey, weigh in on that, because that's an issue that um, Theron talks about quite a bit on this show about the rural, about the suburban women, the white women. Yeah, I, I think what the GOP needs, uh, particularly in this state, but nationwide, is a, a sort of uh, intersectional electoral infrastructure that leverages black and brown and LGBT and, and uh, female um, talent from within the party to sort of build a statewide communication strategy that can respond rapidly to issues of race and gender and, and sex and, and, um, and, and things of that nature. That's what we lack. So we can raise money, but if we can't have, if DeSantis can't respond to Gillum talking about monkeying around, as a racial term, if if Kemp can't respond to Abrams saying that voter he's he's um, propagating voter suppression on the basis of race, and if we can't have a statewide response to that, then then the money is not achieving anything. So so in connection with the money that he is raising, which is a good thing, and we're going to need it, we also need to have this sort of intersectional uh, electoral infrastructure in place. All right. Well, I'm going to move on. State Representative Kevin Tanner is not giving up on a rural transit bill and is working on a compromise to a bill that failed last session. Um, this is a problem that really needs to be addressed in rural Georgia. And if you don't have a car, I mean, how do you get to work, Alexis? Well, you have to thumb a ride. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, that that is interesting option. Uh, well, the problem that they're having is there's nobody there to go to work because they're all moving to the uh, urban areas. Uh, there was a recent uh, survey that said only, what, 17% of the citizens live in the rural areas anymore of the whole state, so there's nobody there. So they just have to move, but move to urban But if center. you create the jobs in these rural areas, Phil, I mean, there was, there was talk about, you know, raising taxes to pay for a rural transit bill. I mean, what do you do for the, the infrastructure there? Well, and, and all of these are, are valid questions. There's two problems with the legislation. Number one, it was tied up with the uh, uh, yeah. fuel tax right. exemption at the, the last airport, 40th right. day, which was really a dumb strategy. Uh, and and it, the airport takeover. In, in the airport takeover, there were three bills that never should have been connected. You're absolutely right. And so it has to be separated, number one. Number two, uh, there's a problem with the State Department of Transportation because uh, the Tanner Bill merges some of these agencies together and the DOT says, wait a minute, uh, there's some unintended consequences here with regard to funding. Some agencies can get money better than others. And so you've got a, a very unusual situation where the State Department of Transportation is pushing back against Kevin Tanner. So there's going to have to be some negotiations to figure all this out. Then we get to how do we help rural Georgia mm -hmm. after we figure out these two mechanical problems with the bill. I think Chairman Tanner is to be committed for this, because commended, because let's think about how committed? this all came, no, commended, <laughs> uh, and should continue to be committed to doing it. And so it's commended and committed. 
And the reason is because you got to remember, you know, when Republicans started talking about expanding transit in the state, which was like a couple years ago, mm -hmm. it was something that was very brave on Chairman Tanner. And it's not also leave out state chairman uh, Brandon Beach as well. And so this was the one issue that Corey kind of talked about that GOP found that they could work with Democrats on. Phil is right. It got caught up in a lot of political maneuvering on the Republicans' parts. And I think they got a little too fancy of trying to have a takeover bill, a Delta fuel tax, and also a rural transit bill. What Chairman Tanner is doing now, Lori, he's coming back and so he's setting the narrative and setting the tone. He has a great relationship with Speaker Rawson. He's got some friends over in the state Senate. And what he's doing is saying, hey, don't put me in this mess that we know is coming back this year with this, I think, unnecessary state takeover uh, bill of the airport. Let's go out and let's continue to talk about the benefits of expanding transit and having more connectivity in this state. And so I think that you're going to see some rural legislators back up Chairman Tanner on this. And then, then we, once we get to the appetite of how we legislate it, then I think there will be some departments like the GDOT and others who will have to come together and figure out how you're going to fully fund it. Okay. One issue I want to um, mention before we go to break, Theron, is we now know where the presidential debate in Atlanta will yeah. be. It will be in the city of Atlanta at the new Tyler Paris, Perry Studios. That's awesome. You know, it was a long debate about where it should be. And, and I got to give, again, Mayor Bottoms uh, and the Democratic National Committee, Daniel Halpern, a lot of different uh, state uh, chairman, chairwoman, Nakima Williams at the Democratic Party of Georgia. It was a long, grueling process. There were so many weeks that I wanted to come on <laughs> and say kind of what I was hearing. But at the end of the day, the thing is, is that Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry is just this steward of just good community. And for him to open up his studios and to say, hey, we're going to construct this new setting and we're going to bring all these folks to the south side of Atlanta, southeast Atlanta particularly, um, I think it's just wonderful, not just for Democrats, but I think it's wonderful for our region. The good news publicity is, for Tyler Perry. Yeah, yeah, and the good news is that there are some great choices. I mean, the new Sandy Springs City Center is beautiful, and that mm -hmm. was in the that's in the 6th District, so they really had some great choices. I think so. one of the things that sets Atlanta aside is, is Atlanta's always for the culture. So I think this is yeah. uh, a brilliant move. Do it for the culture. Do it for the culture. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, coming up, a Fox 5 I-Team investigation, why a grand jury wants the Douglas County coroner out of office. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. A Fox 5 I-Team investigation reveals a Douglas County grand jury is recommending the county coroner be removed from office. She's accused of abuse of her office, signing death certificates on cases that she never worked, Phil. This is quite unusual. I'm not going to say this is a dead issue, but I am going to commend the <laughs> grand jury. She just yeah. said it. I'm going to commend the grand jury because this is, to remind viewers, this is what a grand jury is supposed to do in every county. You're supposed to inspect the county departments for the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we found some bad and ugly here, and I think it needs to be addressed. This is accountability. This is how uh, local systems work. Mm. All right. Well, Randy Travis did a good job on that story. Well, after a high-profile Texas case where a divorced couple fought over the gender identity of their child, a Republican state rep wants to make it a felony for any medical professional to help a child with gender transition here in Georgia. The AJC reports that State Representative Ginny Earhart said she wants to protect children from having ear irreversible procedures done when they are young. Corey, you want to start with this one? Yeah, just to say that I think this is a broader issue of consent. Um, you know, and we should, we should separate the sort of moral opinions about um, LGBT issues, uh, particularly transgender issues, and, and focus on whether or not we want to uh, allow children to make irreversible decisions about their gender that affect their body uh, for the rest of their lives. We don't allow children to decide to smoke until they're 18, drink until they're 21. Um, some of the kids, this child in question is seven years old, we wouldn't let him decide when he's going to go to bed at night. And so I think this is something that um, we believe in a woman's right to make decisions about her own body. We should uh, also afford that child to grow to an age of consent to make decisions about their own bodies. But to make it a felony for the medical profession? Come on, that's so strong. That's ridiculous to do that. I mean, it seems like I agree with a child that should make, the decision should be made with the family, with the parents, without 
you know, having their consent, but my goodness. Well, yeah, it's a felony. Wait a minute. I'm, I agree with Corey. It's a felony, and this is consistency in the law. It's a felony for uh, sexual molestation of children. Uh, we're just kind of making this equal, and you're making a very well, good point. Equal to the well, the, so these youngsters have no. These youngsters. Well, let's right. well, 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 yeah. use providing alcohol to to minors. That that you're trying to undermine the law is to, and we're trying to make it consistent. I think Ginny Earhart is on the right right path here. Now we there is a caveat. We haven't seen the full. Uh, legislation is being drafted now, but I think I think she's on the right track. I think these decisions should be left up to the children, their and families, the and their medical parents. professionals. That's right. And also, what it really is about for me is what's really going through the brain and the thought process of a young child, and the the families that support this child should have an open and honest conversation with their medical professions, professionals. I agree with Alexis. I think saying that it should be a felony and then to compare it with child molestation and a, and a child making a choice with conversations with their medical professionals and their family should not go too far. And so this is something that I think where to take partisanship out, ship out of it, you know, what I'm learning, Lori, is that children are actually more mature on this issue of transgender and whether or not they accept and how they accept when their transgender. Seven years old. No, if you well, look at what's ridiculous. if you look at what's going on in the schools, is I believe that there's a lot of kids out here. When I talk to them, that they in this culture that we live in, this day and age, 2019, are just more mature, and I think that they're more open to looking at it. And so I agree. I think going too far to say that someone should be, you know. Uh, it should be a felony if, if they, the medical professional, with the consent of the parent, with the child's involvement, is just, I think, a little outrageous. Oh. Th this is too much control, and it's typical liberal permissiveness. And again, let's be consistent under the law. And, and these children do not have the capability. That's why, under Georgia law, anyone under 16 is a minor. But so, you're, but, okay, but last. You're not a doctor. You don't know. Last what word on this. know about their own, their own cells and their own bodies. Well, I do know that we don't want to have uh, well, we don't four, want, five, six, or seven year olds. Some of the same, some of the same proponents of this told us that. Uh, gay reversal counseling and therapy was traumatic to children. And so now these same proponents are telling us that irreversible hormone treatments are not traumatic. I think this is not, this doesn't have the type of... I uh, think it, I think it goes to point. the higher, um, but still, to me the it's higher personal, personal subject, decision. which you said, which was about parental consent here. I think that's where the yeah. debate is. And that's where we're going to leave right. it because we're running out of time and we need to get to winners and losers. <laughs> Time now for the week's winners and losers. Darren, we'll start with you. All right, my first winner is going to be Microsoft. Uh, they're planning to expand uh, with 1,000 new jobs in Metro Atlanta. I think they're looking at Midtown, so I want to give a big shout out to Microsoft. Also, I want to give a big shout out to Mary Max Tea Room for being selected <laughs> as one of TripAdvisor's best everyday diners in the country. I think Yay. they're ranked number 24. Yay, Max, yeah. And also, I want to give a big shout out to Richard Dunn, uh, who runs the Environmental Protection Division. Um, we didn't get a chance to really get into it this week, but they're it was on the list. There, but they're stepping up. Yes, uh, they are. Really doing some great things. And he doesn't get a lot of credit. And also, if you look at some of the dumping that we've seen in some of our rivers, I just want to give him and the EPD a big shout out. Phil. I've got uh, my own city of Sandy Springs, Georgia, as the winner. You know, it was the only Georgia city that made uh, the 24-7 Wall Street list of America's safest cities. And so uh, they're using statistics from the FBI's Uniform Crime Report. So hats off to Mayor, uh, <laughs> hats off to Rusty, yeah. Paul, and also Chief Kenneth DeSimone. I want to make sure I get these names right. My loser is the Georgia Department of Corrections. Did you all see the news last week? A child molester and a rape. Mm -hmm. actually walked out of a, uh, a prison and it took three days for the department to actually disclose to the public what happened. I think some heads should roll in the Georgia Department of Corrections. Ooh, they, they did catch him. They though. caught him like in Virginia, I believe, or somewhere yeah. far away. Corey. Yeah, my winner today is President Barack Obama for his uh, poignant critique of so-called woke culture. Uh, where he said, you know, tweeting and judgment and canceling people uh, to show how woke you are is not true activism. Uh, mm -hmm. So I want to make Obama my, my winner there. My loser, I would say, 
is the Democrat House uh, for, I think, undermining the sanctity of impeachment um, and turning impeachment as a tool into something more like the vote of no confidence that we see in, in Europe. So. Um, okay. That's my thank resolution. you, and thank you for filling in this week. Thank you. Alexis. Okay. I'm going to salute Katherine Johnson. She was a longtime Associated Press reporter. She covered the civil rights era uh, extensively, and she got it because no men wanted to do it, because they didn't want to talk to these black people back in the day. And she became a really established, lots of good sources, and she was the only reporter allowed in the home of Martin Luther King Jr. Wow. when he was, the day he was killed and assassinated. So she did, went on to do many other good stories and great stories, and she was a wonderful human being. I had a chance to meet her. Well, that's great. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And we are going to salute Captain Eric Jackson of DeKalb Fire Rescue, one of the best public information officers out there. Simply the best. He had a health scare of his own when he felt pain in his side after several trips to the emergency room. They figured out he had blood clot. So he is telling his story now to hopefully save others. And thank you, Atlanta United, for another great season. One game short of going to the MLS Cup, but another great run for fans. And everybody have a great week. The opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the panelists appearing in this program.